Welcome to Disney for Chapter 11 of Schoolmaster's Riddle. That's a big one. As the two schools slept, two heads surfaced outside in black in the black moat. Sophie and Agatha peeped out at the thin silver tower that divided Lake from Sludge. Too far to swim, too high to climb. A cyclone of fairies guarded the fire, while an army of wolves with crossbows manned wooden plank at, planks at its base. I'm you're sure he's up there, Sophie said. I saw him. He has to help us. I can't go back to that place. Look, we just beg him for mercy until he sent, send us home. Because that'll work, Sophie snorted. Leave him to me. For the last hour, the two girls had mulled every possible way to escape. Agatha thought they should sneak into the woods and find their way back to Galveston. But Sophie pointed out that even if they did get past the gate snake and any other booby trap, they'd just end up lost. They're called the Endless Woods for a reason. Instead, she proposed that they hunt for enchanted broomsticks or magical carpets or something else in the school's closet that might fly them over the forest. And what direction would we fly in? Agatha asked. The two girls discarded other options, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs that never worked. Seeking a kindly hunter or dwarf, Agatha didn't trust strangers. Wishing for a fairy godmother, Sophie didn't trust that woman, until there was only one left. But now, peering up at the schoolmaster's fortress, they lost all hope. We'll never get up there, Sophie sighed. Agatha heard a squawk in the distance. Hold that thought. A short while later, they were back in the blue forest, caked in sludge, eye eyeing a nest of big black eggs from behind a periwinkle bush. In front of the nest, five skeletal simps slept, slept on indigo glass, littered in blood and limbs of a half-eaten coat. Go. Sophie scowled. I'm back where I start, covered in smelly ooze and who knows how many flesh-eating maggots. And what are you doing? As soon as they attack, we jump on. As soon as he what? But Agatha was already tiptoeing to the ice. The shoes burnt your brain, Sophie hissed. As Agatha inched towards the nest, they, she caught a closer look at the sleeping stones, jagged teeth, gnarled talons, and the spiked tails that shred flesh from bone. Suddenly doubting her plan, Agatha backed up, only to trip on a branch and fall on her goat leg with a loud crack. The stimps opened their eyes. Her heart stopped, unless a villain wakes them up. The pink, the pink dress wouldn't fool them. Agatha glowered at the waking friend, fiends. She couldn't give up now. Not when she had Sophie willing to go home. She lunged for the nest, snatched an egg, sprang up for the blitz. Can't watch, can't watch, Sophie mules, squinting through fingers, her spewing limbs and blood. But the vicious birds were nuzzling Ag Agatha like puppy seeking milk. Ooh, that tickles, she squealed. Sophie folded her arms. Clumping back, Agatha handed the egg to her. Your turn. Oh, please, if they like you, they're, they'll try to mate with me. And I'll worship princesses, for, said Sophie. She Sashaying towards the birds, the stimps unleashed a war cry and charged. Help! Sophie threw the egg to Agatha, but the stimps still chased Sophie, who ran in circles like a lunatic. Five stimps, high stepping behind her in moronic maple parade, until everyone forgot who was who, and the birds knocked into each other dizzily. See, I outsmarted them, Sophie beamed. A stimp bit her off bottom. Aye! Sophie ran for the nearest tree, only they couldn't climb trees, so she hurt. She hurled mashed gooseberries at the bird's eye. But the bird had no eye, so the berries went right through bony socket and plopped to the ground. Agatha watched stone-faced. Aggie, it's coming. The stimps charged for Sophie, and only to stop short and find Agatha perched on his back. Get on, you dimwit, she shouted at Sophie. Without a saddle, Sophie scoffed. It'll leave chafe, chafe marks. The stimps lunged for her. Agatha walloped his head its head and flung Sophie by the waist onto the bird's spine. Hang on tight, Agatha yelled as the bird trash, thrashed up to flight. Someone saw him over the bay to get the girls off its back. For four more stimps exploded from the blue trees in murderous pursuit. Agatha kicked on the bird's thigh bones, Sophie holding on for her dear life. This is the worst plan ever! Hearing squawks and screams, the fairies and wolf guards squinted into the sky, only to see the intruders vanish in, into fog. There's the tower, Agatha cried, spotting the silver spire through the mist. A wolf's arrow whizzed between the stem's ribs, almost slicing Sophie in half. Fairy stormed out of the fog, showing golden webs from their mouths, and the stem dove to avoid them, spinning to elude a new hail of wolf arrows. This time, neither girl could hold on and tumbled off its back. No, screamed Agatha. Sophie got the last bone of the stem's tail. Agatha caught the last bit of Sophie's glass shoe. We're going to die, Sophie, Sophie howled. Just to hold on, bellowed Agatha. My hands are sweaty. We're going to die. The stem zoomed for the tower wall, but just as it whipped its tail to ma smash them, Agatha saw a window glint through fog. Now, 
screamed Agatha. This time Sophie was a golden nest shot from every direction and the stint let out a helpless screech. But as fairies watched it plunge to its de death, they looked at each other curiously. There were no riders on its back. The crash landing through the window left Sophie's entire right side bruised and Agatha's wrist gashed. But pain meant nothing meant they were still alive. Pain meant they still had hope for getting home. With a chorus of groans, they staggered to their feet. Then Sophie saw the worst of the damage. My shoe! She held up her glass heel, snapped to a serrated stump. They were one of a kind, she mourned. Agatha ignored her and limped ahead into murky gray ch into the murky gray chamber, barely lit by the window's dawn glow. Hello, Agatha called. Echoes died unanswered. The girls entered further into the shadowy room. Stone bookcase coated, coated gray big walls. Had had packed top to bottom with colorful bindings. Sophie dusted off a shelf and read the elegant silver letters of the wooden spines. Rapunzel, the singing bone, Thumbelina, the frog king, the cabbage, the six swans, all the stories the children of Gavaldon used to drink up. She looked over at Agatha, who ma had made the same discovery across the w room. They were standing in a library of every fairy tale ever told. Agatha opened up Beauty and the Beast to find it written in the same elegant skip script as the spine, illustrating with the vi vivid paintings like the ones in the foyers of both schools. Then she opened up the red shoe, shoes, donkey skin, and the snow queen and found that they too were written in the same regal hand. Aggie? Agatha found, followed Sophie's gaze to the darkest spot of the room. Through shadows, she could make out a white stone table pressed against the wall. She, there was something smooth looming over, looming over it, a long, thin dagger ha dangling magically in midair. Agatha ran her fingers that along the cold, smooth surface of the table and thought of all the blank headstones behind her house waiting for bodies. Sophie's eyes fixed on the hovering knife, eerily still a few feet away from the white slab. Then, that's when she saw it wasn't a knife at all. It's a pen, she said softly. It was made out of pure steel and shaped like a knitting needle, lethally sharp on, at both ends. One side of the pen was involved with a deep, flowing script that ran unbroken from tip to tip. Suddenly, the pen caught a silver sliver of sunlight and scattered blinding gold rays in every direction. Agatha turned from the glare. When she turned back, Sophie was climbing into the table, onto the table. Sophie, no! Sophie walked towards the pen, eyes wide, bo body rigid. The, w the world dissipated in a blur gray around her. All that remained was a shimmering spindle-sharp pen, Stra strange words reflecting in her glazed eyes. Somewhere inside, she knew what they meant. She reached for the tip. Don't, Agatha cried. Sophie's skin kissed ice cold steel, blood out about to pierce through. Agatha tackled her, and both girls crashed to the table. Sophie broke from her trance and peered at Agatha so suspiciously. I'm on, I'm on a table with you. You were about to touch it, Agatha said. Huh? Why would I touch it? Her eyes drifted up to the pen, which was no longer still. It dangled an inch from their faces, pointing between them and with its deadly sharp tip, as if weighing who to kill first. Don't move, Agatha said between clenched teeth. The pen seared hot red. Move, she cried. The pen plunged for pl lunge, and both girls rolled off the table, only to see the razor's sharp nib lurch to a stop just before it hit, a st hit stone. A puff of black smoke and a book suddenly appeared on the table beneath it. Bound with cherry red wood, the pen flipped the cover over, open to the first blank page and began to write. Once upon a time, there were two girls, the same elegant script as all the others, a brand new fairy tale. Sophie and Agatha gaped the floor, t from, the, gaped from the floor terrified. Now that's odd, said a gentle voice. The girls whipped around. No one went there. Suddenly at my school train and toil for four years, venturing to the woods to seek their nemesis, fight vicious battles, all for, just for the hope the story and might tell their story. The girl spun, spun around. No one in the room at all, but but then they saw their shadow emerge on the wall into the crooked shadow that kidnapped them. The girls turned slowly, and here it starts one for two first years, unskilled, uns, untrained, clumsy intruders, said the schoolmaster. He wore silver robes that billowed over his hunched cylinder frame, hiding his hands and feet. A rusted crown set off centered on his head of thick, ghostly white hair. A gleaming silver mask covered every last shred of his face, revealing only twinkling blue eyes and wide full lips curled in a mischievous smile. It must suspect a good ending. The story and dove to the page. One was beautiful and beloved, and the other was lonely was a lonely hag. I like our story, Sophie said. It hasn't gotten to the part 
where your parents come to zoo, said Agatha. Homeward ho, homeward ho, Sophie sulked. They looked up and saw the schoolmaster studying them. Readers are unpredictable, of course. Some have been our greatest students. Most of them have been embarrassing failures. He gazed, he gazed at the distant towers, turning his back to the girls. But this sh just shows how confusing readers have become. Agatha heart pounded. There, this was their chance. She jabbed Sophie. Go. I can't. Sophie whispered. You said leave him to you. He's too old. Agatha elbowed her in the ribs. Sophie elbowed her back. Many of the facility faculty say, I kidnap you, steal you, take you against your will, the schoolmaster said. Agatha kicked Sophie forward, but the truth is I free you. So Sophie swallowed and took off her broken shoe. You deserve to live extraordinary lives. Sophie crept towards the schoolmaster, raising her jagged heel. You deserve to ch the chance to know who you are. The schoolmaster turned to Sophie, who shoe poised over his heart. We deserve... We demand our release, Agatha cried. Silence. Sophie dropped to her knees. Oh, please, sir, we beg for mercy, Agatha groaned. You took me f you took me for good, Sophie sobbed, sobbed Sophie, but they put me in evil. And now my dress is black and my hair is dirty and my prince hates me and me, me and my roommates are murderers and there's no groom rooms for never so now. She let us prattle. Well, I I smell. She brawled in her hands. So, you'd like to switch schools? The schoolmaster asked. What well, we'd like to go home, said Agatha. Sophie looked up brightly. Can we switch schools? The schoolmaster smiled. No. Then we'd like to go home. Sophie said. Lost in a strange land, the girls wanted to go home. The story noted. We have sent students home before. The schoolmaster said. Silver mask flaring. Illness mental. Inca incapacity, the petition of an influential family. So you can send us home, Agatha said. Indeed I could, said the schoolmaster, if you weren't in the midst of a fairy tale. He eyed the pen across the room. You see, once the story and begins your story, then I'm afraid we must follow it wherever it takes you. Now the question is, will you, will your story take you home? The story and plunged to the page. Stupid girls, they were trapped for eternity. I suspect as much, said the schoolmaster. So there's no way home, Agatha asked, eyes welling. Not unless it's your ending, the schoolmaster said. And going home together is a rather far-fetched ending for two girls fighting to op for opposite sides, don't you think? But we don't want to fight, Sophie said. We're on the same side, said Agatha. We're friends, Sophie said, clasping Agatha's friend. Friends, the schoolmaster marveled. Agatha looked just as surprised, feeling Sophie's grip. Well, that certainly changed things, schoolmaster. Please paced like a doddering duck. You see, a princess and a witch can never be friends in our world. It's unnatural. It's unthinkable. It's impossible. Which means you, if you are indeed friends, Agatha must not be a princess and Sophie must not be a witch. Exactly, said Sophie, because I'm the princess and she's the witch. Agatha kicked her. And if Agatha is not a princess and Sophie is not a witch, then clearly I've got it wrong and you don't belong in our world at all, he said, pace, pace slowing. Maybe that what everyone says about me is true after all. That you're good, Sophie said. That I'm old, the schoolmaster sighed out of the out the window. Agatha couldn't contain her excitement. So can we go home now? Well, there is the only matter of pr pr proving all this. But I've tried, Sophie said. I've tried proving proving I'm not a villain. And I've tried proving I'm not a princess, said Agatha. Ah, but there's one, only one way in this world to prove who you are. The story and st stop its busy writing, sentencing a pivotal moment. The slow... Slowly, the schoolmaster turned. For the first time, his blue eyes had a glint of danger. What's the one thing evil can never have, and the one thing good can can never do without? The girls looked at each other. So we solve your riddle and you send us home? Agatha asked hopefully. The schoolmaster turned away. I trust I won't see either of you again, unless you want a rather depressing end to your story. Suddenly the room started disappearing in a sweep of white, as as if the scene was being erased before their eyes. Wait, Agatha cried. What are you doing? First the bookshelves vanished, then the walls. No, we want to go home now, Agatha yelled. Then the ceiling, the table, the floor ar around them. The two girls lunged, l lunged to a corner to avoid being erased. How do we find now? Find you. How do we answer? Agatha ducked to avoid a streak of white. You're cheating. 
Across the room, Sophie saw the story and furiously writing to keep up with their fairy tale. The pen sensed her gaze, for the words in its steel suddenly seared red, and Sophie's heart burned again with secret understanding. Scarred, she clung to Agatha. You thief, you bully, you masked face, old creep. Agatha screamed, you were fine without you. Readers are fine without you. Stay in your tower with your mask and masks and pens, and stay out of it. Our lives. You hear me? Steal children from other villages and leave us alone. The last thing they saw was a schoolmaster turn from the window, smiling in a sea of white. What other villages? The ground vanished beneath the two girls' feet. Feet behind, beneath the two girls' feet, and they three fell into emptiness. The schoolmaster's last words echoing, blending into the wolves' call to morning class. They woke, blinded by sunlight, swimming in puddles of sweat. Agatha looked at for Sophie. Sophie found looked for Agatha, but all they found were their own beds in towers far apart. So that's the end of chapter. Um, and the riddle is: What's the one thing evil can never have, and the one thing good can never do without? So think about that, and maybe try and see if you can find the answer for that riddle as well. Um, thanks for watching, and uh, click the.